What happens when a state is abusing human rights or committing crimes against humanity against its own people? Should the world get together and do something about it? The concept of the responsibility to protect, or R2P, challenges the traditional international relations concept of sovereignty and creates a framework that legitimizes humanitarian intervention. It proposes that states have the primary responsibility for protecting their own people. However, if they fail to do so, that responsibility falls on the international community. We're exploring the concept of R2P in more detail right now. We'll start here by looking at one of the major failures of the United Nations, the genocide in Rwanda. Over 100 days in 1994, over 800,000 minority Rwandan Tutsis were murdered by extremists from the majority Hutu population. One of the most shocking things about this whole event was that the United Nations had peacekeeping forces on the ground as this was all unfolding. But based on code of conduct principles, they could not engage to stop the killings, and the United Nations Security Council did not authorize an intervention. As you can imagine, major questions followed about the role of the United Nations when they couldn't even stop a genocide from happening when they were already there. Following his experiences, the leader of the UN mission in Rwanda, Canadian General Romeo Dallaire, wrote of his support of military humanitarian intervention when necessary to uphold human rights. How do we pick and choose where to get involved? Canada and other peacekeeping nations have become accustomed to acting if, and only if, international public opinion will support them. A dangerous path that leads to moral relativism in which a country risks losing sight of the difference between good and evil. Following the genocide in Rwanda, along with events like the 1995 Srebrenica massacre and the 1999 Kosovo war, showed that there might need to be a framework in place for justified and legitimate humanitarian military intervention. In a report outlining the vision for the UN in the new millennium, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan wrote of the need of this humanitarian intervention, even if it violates the principle of sovereignty. If humanitarian intervention is, indeed, an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations of human rights that offend every precept of our common humanity. We confront a real dilemma. Few would disagree that both the defense of humanity and the defense of sovereignty are principles that must be supported. Alas, that does not tell us which principles should prevail when they are in conflict. In the wake of all this, in the late 1990s, on an initiative led by the Government of Canada, the International Commission on Intervention and Sovereignty, or ICISS, published and presented the report on the responsibility to protect in 2001. The report states that, ultimately, state sovereignty should be the fundamental principle of international relations, and that first and foremost, states themselves have the responsibility to protect the safety and well-being of their own citizens. However, if states fail in this responsibility, and all other preventative means and diplomacy have exhausted all options, after all, military action should be the last resort. The international community is justified in intervening to bring the crisis to an end. Right? So with R2P, the responsibility to protect its citizens falls number one on the state, and failing that, only then does that responsibility to protect fall on the international community to intervene. According to the R2P principle, four criteria need to be met to justify intervention. Number one is the just cause threshold, that there needs to be an imminent, major loss of life or ethnic cleansing. Number two are the precautionary principles. This idea that all other means of bringing the crisis to an end have been exhausted, that the intervention needs to be done with the right intentions, and that the military action has to be proportional to the situation and needs a reasonable chance of success. The third criteria for R2P is the idea that the intervention needs the right authority. And what this means in principle is that there should be a UN Security Council resolution to authorize the military action. 
And as good students of international relations, you should know that can be a very tricky thing to achieve. And the fourth criteria has to do with the operational principles. The objectives need to be clear and unambiguous, with a clear understanding that the use of force is only temporary, and that after the military action is finished, the international community needs to remain in order to help with peace building and reconciliation. You can't just bomb and run. In short, and I like the way this is explained by the former director of policy planning in the Barack Obama administration, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who sees the definition of sovereignty under R2P as a shift. If you are a sovereign state and you are a member of the United Nations, and virtually all sovereign states are, then sovereignty doesn't mean you can do whatever you like with your own people as long as you don't harm a fellow sovereign. It doesn't mean you have the right to act independently on the world stage and no one can interfere with what you do. Instead, the responsibility to protect means a kind of conditional sovereignty. It says, I am a sovereign state, but by signing the UN Charter, I agree that I have a fundamental duty to protect my own citizens from grave and systematic human rights violations, meaning crimes against humanity, genocide, or systematic and widespread killing. So how has R2P played out in the real world? One of the major examples is in the intervention in Libya in 2011 to depose the government of Muammar Gaddafi. The UN passed Security Council Resolutions 1970 and 1973, specifically citing R2P as the justification for the intervention. This coming, on the heels of Muammar Gaddafi's crackdown on protesters in Libya following the Arab Spring movement. While the NATO-led intervention successfully helped in deposing Gaddafi, unrest continued and the country again descended into civil war in 2014, this time lasting until late 2020. One of the major arguments for the long-term failure of R2P in Libya is that the NATO allies involved in the intervention didn't participate enough in that crucial final step of any R2P intervention, rebuilding and reconciliation. While it has also been invoked in some action in places like South Sudan and Yemen, perhaps the biggest examples are where R2P hasn't been used. The Syrian civil war and the crisis in Myanmar are two global issues where intervention could fall under the principle of the responsibility to protect. In both cases, the UN Security Council has been unable to come to a resolution, in part because of the political interests of the five veto powers on the council. R2P is certainly a noble effort, and the protection of people around the world from crimes against humanity should be of the utmost importance. But with the way the international system is structured, is it possible? Is it still a viable principle in today's political landscape? And if we should continue to pursue the principle, what roadblocks need to be addressed that prevent the responsibility to protect from being invoked in the situations that need it? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. And if you learned something today, give this video a like, subscribe and ring that bell if you haven't already so you don't miss anything in the future, and we will see you again next time.